Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Today's program was brought to you by 100 Bogart Street, the brand new co-working space in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Learn more at 100bogart.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported food radio network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. Join our hosts as they lead you through the world of craft brewing, behind the scenes of the restaurant industry, inside the battle over school food, and beyond. Find us at heritageradionetwork.org. Hello and welcome to Snacky Tunes. I am one half your host, Greg Bresnitz. On today's episode, we have Chef Nira Kehar to talk about her new book, Ohas, and how to balance your own personal dosha with this specific spice blend. And later on, we have most of Hesses Moore live in studio with a very special first-time Skype call-in performance and interview from Copenhagen to talk about a captainless boat adrift at sea. Schooner or motorboat to be decided here on Snacky Tunes Podcast. We talk about food. We talk about music. With musical dudes. Finger on the pulse. Snacky Tunes.
Snacky Tunes. I'm one half of your host, Greg Bresnitz. That was just Hesses Moore, who will be mostly live in studio today with our first ever call-in Skype musical performance and interview from Copenhagen. A few housekeeping notes beforehand. If it's your first time listening to us, please make sure to go over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast to leave us a review, give us, give us some stars, and hit subscribe. We'd really appreciate it. Also, coming up in Los Angeles on Tuesday, March 13th, we are doing our first Snacky Tunes Live in partnership with our good friends at Golden Voice. You will get a plate of food from our fine friends at Wexler's Deli and a live performance from Naya. We will be on, on stage interviewing them, playing a couple games, and having a generally good time on the West Coast. Head to bit.do backslash Snacky Tunes Live, just as it sounds, to get your tickets. Hello, Chef. Hi. In studio today, we have Nira Kehar, who I'm going to call Nini, just because. Yeah. yeah no. We're friends now. Yeah. We've been trying not to have a conversation for the last hour and a half while waiting for this. So welcome. Thank um, you. You are from Montreal. Our family's from Montreal. Really? Yes. How did your family get there? My father uh, moved, to, uh, Im- immigrated to Montreal from, uh, from India. Why Montreal? He had an uncle there. It was as simple as that. Always an uncle. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's always got an uncle somewhere. Like, let's go. Yeah. Why did he leave India for Montreal? Uh, for a better life for his family. He was the eldest, so he uh, he immigrated and, you know, started his uh, started working and developing a career and, and brought, eventually brought a lot of his family over to Canada as well. When were you born? Uh, in 81. 81. Yeah. And when did you, I and mean, you didn't start in cooking. You had a much more technical computer engineering degree or, or start. How did that come about? Uh, the engineering? Yeah. I think it's just a, a factor of uh, um, in my family, and I think culturally, uh, Indian parents really push you towards what they call more of a profession, um, whereas we were always encouraged to creative endeavors as hobbies, which I was naturally always more inclined to, but I always enjoyed the sciences, and I think they've been a great backbone for having a business and being a chef, weirdly enough. I thoroughly enjoyed my engineering career. How did you, how have you integrated it or what are some of the kind of top line things you've pulled into your culinary career? Uh, well, engineering requires a lot of abstract thinking, especially because I was in computer engineering. And so there's a lot of problem solving and organizing a very busy schedule and a lot of a workload. So being a chef is a, also a constant nonstop life and having a restaurant is pretty much the same. So I, I also designed and, and a lot of the restaurants. So because you do have to do a lot of design work in all of the engineering that you do, it kind of was helpful in many, many parts of, of the, of the job. You mentioned a side, your interest being kind of side, side careers, hustles, hobbies, et cetera. Who got you into cooking and anyone in your family did you lean on for experience and education? We always grew up with amazing food. Everything from my house, in my house was made from scratch, but I was never really into cooking itself. Um, Who cooked? My mother. Okay. Always my mother, my father. I don't even never even seen him make an egg. <laughs> um, yeah, so the women in in our family, aunties and mom, cooked amazingly well. So we grew up and what really good food, no junk food, amazing products. Just never really thought of it. It was just so natural, and I didn't know how to cook at all until I was well into my I think twenties. Was there a strong community around you? Were you able to get the ingredients that were from home, or were they imported, or what was it like growing up for the culinary experience? 
in, in, in childhood. Montreal, yeah, in childhood in Montreal. Amazing ingredients. Um, very beautiful farmers markets. My mom would really use what was seasonal and you know buy it and p either pickle some things make jams and on a regular basis we really did it according to the seasons but it wasn't even a thought in my mind until later i got into cooking and realized how much i was lucky to have grown up that way which markets in montreal i mean we grew up going to jean talon jean talon at water market yeah both of those mostly did you have one did you do in the like parisian way where, like one was really good for one thing another place was really good for thing or would you just go to like the market and just kind of be able to fill your baskets there well, it was more my mother and I would, you know, in childhood go grocery shopping with her. So it was like, I think some things in certain places. And by the time I was an adult, I was pretty much moved to India for 10 years. So I didn't really get to have that experience in Montreal myself. She's like, call it the eggs. <laughs> <laughs> and you ended up going to culinary school in Quebec. Yes. Which, and I'm very curious about that experience because a lot of people talk about going to culinary school in America, um, going to in London, to, to Paris, but it, not too many talk about culinary school in Quebec w what year was it and, and what was the experience like and, and do you know any differences now that your other chefs have experienced based on where they went on their locale it's not really a discussion I've had with many of the chefs that I've like either worked with or or chatted with but um, I know that it's mostly to do with you know the schools being private year and that school is an amazing institute but it's funded by the government and so as that's mostly the difference between usually Canada and the U.S. Um, and I know that the education is just costs very, very much here, but I don't, I didn't see any differences between the skill set I was able to acquire and the knowledge I was able to attain in the Institute that I went to, as opposed to the ones I've heard of around here or in Europe. It's was pretty there, much the same. Was there a different, was it focused on French technique or yes. what was the, it was? Yeah, we had a back, we had modules in Italian cooking as well, but mostly it was uh, French technique, but you know, Canadian French technique. They're like, we know how to you know how to make beaver, poutine, <laughs> and all the mother sauces. Uh, I, I, I hear a lot of that, but no, it's uh, it's basically the classic French culinary technique. And what kick what kicked off your culinary tour? What brought you back home to India? And like, what was it that kind of dr drug you back to your home roots? Well, you know, even the way you word that question shows a lot of because I'm born and raised in Montreal. Mm -hmm. I never even really been to India that much before. My parents, being from there, people assumed. Oh, you're going back to India. I, I, it's, I looked the part and I lived in a country where I knew nothing really of the culture because mm. I didn't even grow up around that many Indian people. Mm. Um, whereas then when I'm in Montreal, people are like, where are you from? And when I go to India, people are like, where are you from? Right. So um, going there, my teacher actually had told me that it would be an interesting, he's like, you don't really know anything of your culture and you really are looking to connect with something. And to, you know, I was always very interested in Ayurveda and yoga. And to me, that was the part of my culture that I connected to. Um, Could you explain that just for the audience who doesn't know what the practice is and the 5,000 years of history behind it? Yes. Uh, yoga is the, uh, well, the science of yoga goes beyond the physical postures, which we identify them to be. It's a philosophy for in attaining oneness with the, you know, higher cosmic intelligence. And that's a very broad and abstract uh, thought, but it, it's precisely what it is. Um, Ayurveda is the science of, and the knowledge of life. So how to feed your body, how to, what kind of a lifestyle to live, to, to be in balance. Um, the principles of Ayurveda go from the very general basic topics to a vast science you can study for the rest of your life. So the, both, both are sister sciences. Um, they are based on the same philosophies. One is more as far as nourishing your body with all things, mostly being food, spices and herbs, as far as the, the very physical experience. And the rest has to do with a mindset um, a perspective on life. And did you discover this in Montreal or did you discover when you went back, we went to India for the first time? Actually, I didn't get to see much of that in India. When I was there, you really, I had to look for it, weirdly enough. I grew, when I was growing up, I, I fell upon a book uh, called Pramahansa Yogananda's Autobiography of a Yogi. And uh, I had chosen it just for the sheer act of like reading the thickest book I could find in the library <laughs> and I fell in love it was like my Harry Potter when I was young it was a world of that seemed fantastical yet very real and somewhere I connected with on the inside and and since then I was really just taken by everything to do from like holistic views to sciences to the way of eating and yoga and that's kind of really where it started and I was only 10 years old at the time when you got to New Delhi 
what did you find there? What experiences and what foods were you open to that you had not previously experienced from your home cooking s- situation? I think I was familiar most mostly with all the food. The food systems were interesting. Um, I know that they had been, you know, there was a big crisis in the 80s to do with the farmers having been given seeds from companies like Mons- Monsanto. And there was like a huge mass suicide, farmer suicides. And like there was a very big controversy on how the country was going to move forward. Is you know, it, organic wasn't a term because everything was organic. Like it was in a, the consciousness around that was just, it was the only way. Um, so when I, now I see a lot of people really strongly working towards a movement where going back to the old ways, which were more wholesome and holistic, as far as accessibility to ingredients, I had a challenge as a chef because I was trying to um, recreate what I knew in Montreal. And then being exposed to a whole new set of ingredients, I eventually had to learn to fall in love with those ingredients, which I did. And learn to make the recipes with the same technique and with the same imagination, but with what was around me. I, and I, I always continued to read on Ayurveda and try to live a very much more holistic life myself and notice that was much more balancing for my body. What led you to open up your restaurant and your brasserie? And why did you decide to go French? in the in in the country and stick to a more classic type of cooking i saw a gap in a market where culturally it's not so common to have restaurants and for people to eat out i mean in the last 10 to 15 years yes but before it was very much like going it was a special occasion people usually eat at home and they would go to what they call like a hotel which would be like a restaurant in a hotel or a very formalized kind of version of eating out it's And I saw that people, you know, were really well traveled in the culture. The Western culture was more and more of an influence in especially big cities like Delhi. And I didn't, I know that Italian food had already like been welcome and Chinese food. And I I could see people had a curiosity. Now, whether I would say a French brasserie to me in a chef owned restaurant has a lot more. It's hard to say that you draw lines on what cuisine it is anymore because we are all so exposed to so many techniques and ingredients and cooking styles that I feel like it's more of an, a cuisine that is born of imagination and of experience than to only classify it as French. The technique I use is based on French culinary techni- techniques that I learned. And then beyond that, it has to do with everything that I'm intaking from my experiences and the food that I eat and the ingredients I get to be exposed to. As a fellow Canadian, I have I noticed there was poutine on the the menu. So, what yeah. ingredients and how did you make poutine, knowing that you had to pull locally, and with all of the influences and restrictions that you had, how was it prepared? How was it served? And how was it received? It was received really well. It's really hard not to. It's a basic and weirdly like very lovable food. That's it's a comfort food at the end of the day. And since there are a lot of vegetarians in India, I wanted to create as much flavor in the gravy without using beef bones or or any sort of a meat product so i made a caramelized onion gravy um i was having an issue with the potatoes because you know to get the crispiness and so we found a way at the right temperatures and a technique of cutting them freezing them and then triple frying them and and then we made our own cheese curd um which it wasn't rubbery like the one you find in Montreal grocery stores but it was nice and fresh and and we made a spice mix which is similar to the Montreal steak spice mix um, and if I tried to change the spice mix according to the season to balance the body, I know poutine isn't exactly a healthful food, but I think that any food you eat, you should find a way to strike a balance with your body and, you know, eat it with less guilt and more, um, mindfulness. What took you out of the restaurant or what, what ended that and, and kind of kicked off the next phase of your career? I think I, when I start, I never had a business before. And when I started the restaurant, it was a creative endeavor, to and and I you know it was the ignorance that was able, allowed me to go into it so wholeheartedly sorry wholeheartedly um, and then at the point where I was deciding to sell the restaurant I realized that it was running more running like a machine and you know I was working twelve to fifteen to twenty hours a day and I really wanted to get more into the creative aspect and the holistic aspect of food so it was a tough decision it's like letting go of what could seem like a child you give life to something and then it has to go on but it it felt like the right time creatively and in my life as far as what I needed uh, personally then you began to work on other projects I know that you worked on the India Art Fair what was the collaboration there and how did you fold food into the the overall festival well Delhi has uh, 
there's a lot of importance on the art fair. It it has grown because there aren't so many such um, events that happen. So a lot of other things get attached to them or so many people show up that it's an opportunity to create a cultural space, to create an interactive uh, market. So the art fair was done much more like a business initially. And then um, I worked with the art fair director to say, you know, why not create a cultural space here? There's no not so many galleries yet in the city. There's not so much of that happening. So it's an opportunity when thousands upon thousands of people are coming for them to be exposed to artists and to different types of cuisines and chefs. And so I helped to, to kind to consult on the different spaces to be created and different types of cuisines that could be available um, to create a cultural space and the business space kind of together at the fair. Did you have to approach the food you were making uh, in a different way for the fair, given that it was going to be such a diverse group of people? Or did you have a point of view that you wanted to get across to the people coming in? Well, a lot of the, there were different vendors and I did do a pop-up restaurant in the first year. I had to just make stuff that could be prepared more quickly. Um, it's hard to do that when you're, I, I don't want to, I don't forego on like freshness and, and all of that. So we were in constant production and cooking mode. I, I think it just really had to do with maybe not sh- having the whole menu. A lot of the dishes were really similar and there was just like constant lineup of people and the hecticness of dealing that with the, in the first few days. But then we caught up and it was pretty much the same food, just less options. We're going to take a quick musical break from the archives and we're going to come back and talk about your new book uh, and your first book that you self-published as well. This is a track by Lily McQueen uh, who was sent to us by Mr. Andrew Oposo who will be playing... Uh, later today in Hesse's More. Here we go from the archives on Snacky Tunes Radio. Play style, you're messing with my mind. And don't talk if you're gonna waste my time. I I put my heart out on the line Make me believe then you leave Now I'm living with your lies It's time you realize That my heart won't give in and compromise No, I Oh, I Hey, you're You're not ready for my love It's kind of lost to tell No This time I'm calling your blood
Your first book, Eating Stories, was self-published, and it focused on storytelling through food. Were they stories that you wrote, stories you picked from other people, and what what type of food did you use to kind of convey the message of the storytelling? Well, I was cooking at, at the James Beard house in uh, October of 2014, and I was coming from a place of like magical chaos of like, having a restaurant in India. And I wanted to actually, that was a story I was trying to tell of how I started that journey and how basically I'd come to the point of being here in New York and cooking. And I wanted to do it with uh, illustration and photography to be able to bring the diner or the person showing up to this event to that context. Um, so I told that story through the six tastes. What were the and the six tastes which you brought over to your current book, yes. Ojas, which is so beautifully designed. And I know we weren't allowed to talk about it beforehand, but it's a really incredible book. You get exactly what it is with the zodiac and the seasons. But could you explain the six tastes and the other kind of two organizing concepts behind the book as well? Of course. Um, so in in starting with the book, I had the idea of dividing the twelve chapters according to the. 12 periods of the zodiac not to be mistaken with astrology it's not really zodiac signs as in like the day you were born and it's not affected by that it's the periods of the zodiac to reflect something where we can zoom out of our own reality and kind of an ode to our, our ancestors who would live by the stars so they would they would navigate the seasons as well as you know the earth by looking up at the constellations so i feel like today where there's so many rules on how to eat and what to do and you get so zoomed into your own existence it's a way of kind of zooming out and getting a more comprehensive reality at the same time where it's like um a month by month guide to you know mostly the ingredients that are available at that time the spices and herbs and the w cooking styles that will help you balance your health according to how the earth is at that time and how your body is reacting to the seasons and the 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 temperature changes, etc. You mentioned the six tastes. Can you yes. run through them and how they influence the recipes in the book? Yes. Um, the six tastes are very important in Ayurveda. They are sweet, sour, salty, pungent, astringent, and bitter. I got the, all the six, right? Yeah, okay. I think that, yeah. Um, so the six tastes are what they use in Ayurveda. To, and you should have a good balance of the six tastes, but depending on your individual constitution, time of year, and a few other deciding factors. Of course, in Ayurveda, you can look at things in the more generalized way, which has a good, still has a good effect on your balancing of your body. And the, the standard is that you are naturally in perfect health. And any deviation from that is basically needs to be brought back to balance. And so the six tastes are used. And, you know, the tastes are not the obvious taste where you think sugar is sweet. Lentils are also considered sweet. So it has a lot more to do with understanding that intuitive to get that to intuitive understanding from the principles and looking at the recipes, you get a better idea of that. So each of the chapters has one recipe for each of the six tastes, meaning that taste is the dominant taste for that recipe. What I like about this book is that it allows you to kind of, even if you just follow it, just kind of sight unseen, it's going to give you a good, a good kind of balance. But you also make it really personal based on your dosha. So can you explain that and mm -hmm. how you balance the spices to kind of bring things back into to center or based on how, you, how fiery you are? Yes, of course. Uh, the three doshas of Ayurveda, which are vata, pitta, kapha, are exist in everybody and in everything. And they are a con composition of the five elements, which is the main concept of Ayurveda as well, that everything is made of the five elements. And now these three energies knows, known as your doshas, which exist in everybody, exist in everybody in a different ratio and in, very, in many levels also. So to figure out what your predominant doshas are, meaning the one you had more at birth and what your blueprint is and where you are actually the dosha of how you are living your life right now affects your health, your digestive system, everything to do with your body and your mind. Um, the more you understand that, in the beginning of the book, I have something called the constellations of clarity, which are five, uh, five or six, sorry, I can't remember, topics, uh, base topics on Ayurveda. So you can start to develop an understanding on how to use um, how, how the doshas exist inside of you and the basic concepts of Ayurveda. And then we have a dosha test in the book so you can uh, figure out where you lean more towards generally for your whole life and then also where you are as you are today. And in the, each of the recipes, there is advice for how you can balance uh, that recipe according more to the dosha you have and how each of the ingredients kind of affects that 
uh, towards one or the other as well. This book is really set up for long-term adjustments and long-term games. If people were to follow the advice in here and really adhere to the principles, let's say after a year, what could they expect to feel, mind, body, soul? What could they expect to experience from following these principles? I would like to take that much credit, but I would say that what the book, the effort of the book was to be part of the um, awareness, the community that's bringing the awareness of Ayurveda to the world. And more and more people all around the world are following Ayurvedic principles and an Ayurvedic lifestyle. My goal was to take the recipes that I love, the ingredients that I've fallen in love with over time, and the ease of using spices and herbs without hesitation. So I can't claim to make like health changes for you, but I would like for people to be at more at ease to use such ingredients to balance their health. You know, I have everything from a duck confit uh, kitchen, which from to like different types of salads. And I can't imagine that somebody will eat the recipes of the book every day diligently. And I don't think that's really the idea. The idea is to develop that intuition into the food that you also do make at home or to develop your own food from it. So building blocks and, and an intuition is more the intention of the book. Before we get you out of here, mm-hmm. you have a cooking event coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. Can yes. you tell about it? It's at one of my favorite all-time spots, Black Flamingo, which if you haven't been, great food upstairs, amazing club downstairs. You should go spend a night there. It's perfect. What's the event? Any particular tie to today's musical guest by any chance? <laughs> yes. It is a collaboration with Michael Hess um, from the band Hess is More. And uh, we're doing a six-course dinner for this. Um, the, the, the Black Flamingo team ha- is uh, part doing a project called the DJ Cookbook, where they're collaborating different musicians and chefs together to do an event um, to celebrate the two di- different disciplines together. Um, so the event, we're doing a dinner. It's a small event for 25 people. And um, Mikkel will be creating sound to open the taste for each of the courses. And so, yeah, that's on March 12th. And, um, and you'll, yeah, you'll later be able to get the visuals and more explanation in the DJ cookbook. Amazing. And we encourage everyone to check out the website as well. Mm-hmm. It's really cool. And it's got playlists, travel guides from Soul Clap and other people. It's, it's really awesome. Yeah. Well, Chef, thanks for coming by. Thank you we for having me. appreciate it. Um, where can people find the book, follow your adventures, learn more about your practice, etc.? Well, the book is going to be available on all the usual platforms, Amazon and in bookstores. And um, and then I have an Instagram handle, which I'm going to begin when the book is officially launched called You Are What You Feast. Very nice. Yes. Very nice. Well, we're going to play another song from our archives uh, featuring Mr. Raposo's band Midnight Magic, where this all kicked off seven years ago. Cannot believe it. <laughs> and then we'll have Hesses Moore live in studio and live from Copenhagen here on Snacky Tunes. Thank you. 
Street is finally open and ready for Bushwick. 100 Bogart is a brand new, state-of-the-art co-working space that provides turnkey workspaces, including open layout desks, meeting spaces, and furnished private offices. Members have access to top-notch amenities such as custom furniture, high-speed internet, spacious kitchenettes with coffee and tea, printers, scanners, and much more. Alongside their professional work environment, 100 Bogart also provides exclusive educational programming for any curious entrepreneur. Heritage Radio Network has made their new office home at 100 Bogart and will host many events there in the future. For more information about their co-working space, visit 100bogart.com and become a member to network, create, and educate. Welcome back to Snacky Tunes. We have Hesses Moore, mostly live in studio. Mikael, are you there? I'm right here. Yes, hello from Copenhagen. How is it over there? It's uh, good and snowy. I'm uh, currently at my mom's house, so uh, yeah, I'm making good use of the time. Yes. I'm held up here by some uh, some security issues with my visa. Yes, but, you, you're uh, not allowed to... I believe in... that's going to pass soon. Yes. Yeah, so well, I mean, as we spoke, you have an event here in a couple of weeks, so we we definitely need you over yes. over for the event. Uh, before we get to your band members who are sitting here in studio, I want to go back um, and talk about the origin of this project, which is about a dozen years ago. Um, how did how did you concept this? I mean, you don't normally see too many drummer centric projects. Um, what was your training, and and how did this come to light? Um, yes, it's. I guess the the idea of me as a band leader started uh, in a very sort of protected environment, where it was literally just the time where it became normal for us to have personal computers, and uh, so I could uh, investigate uh, that world of creating my own music without any ears or any people telling me I was useless. And I, I did it long enough that that I sort of started to feel, oh, maybe there's something going on here. So it was it was literally that. I think the door that opened for me was that 
possibility to just sit alone and try things out in my own slow tempo. And then over the years, I've become uh, more comfortable with that role. And now I'm courageous enough to have a band of people who are all much more skilled and talented than me. So, so that that's really my uh -huh. biggest accomplishment over these soon. I think it's 18 years. So I've I've come out of that shell in in a major way. And and just to be clear, when you started, what, was your bandmate, your computer, and everything was done as a solo project with layering in other kind of instrumentation, loops, samples, etc. Yes, exactly. I, I started out just in my own little confined space with myself and a computer. That's a, that's a perfect band made for, for a shy composer. What limitation, then, what limitation did you feel you reached that you had to start bringing in other humans? Well, I think the first sort of limitation was in the presentation of the live concert, where I just, I guess, uh, the, the way my, my computer and I played together wasn't really... Um, that stimulating and and maybe not for others to be to witness so that's why it really starts to come much more to life in in live concerts with uh, having the band grow and have musicians come in so so that was sort of the first call for and then and then at, at some point the, the live concert got so strong that it started to miss that energy in the studio work so so then it kind of so it's almost been let pendulum back and forth that then it was like well we love the concerts like why don't you have more of that energy in the studio and it's like yeah right were were your early collaborators um from copenhagen or or were they transatlantic or how did you start to put your band together yes the the, the very first sort of live collaborator i had uh, was um my older brother nikolai who also um by coincidence of snowstorm and other good things, happens to be here uh, with me, um, and and he's still a, a member of the group. So so we'll attempt a little four-handed piano here later on. But um, yeah, so it started sort of very locally, and then after I moved, uh, relocated to New York in 2008, uh, things took a took a turn, and and it became an all New York lineup. Andrew, um, when did you enter into the picture? Uh, I saw them play at some point in 2011, 2012. Um, I mean, I, I'd met Michael before because he was playing with David and Matt in Twos and Fours, which is this collaborative that Matt Parker and Julio Monterey started. And they were playing every Tuesday night at Coco 66 down the block from our recording studio. R.I.P. R.I.P. Is, is, is it R.I.P.? <laughs> I feel like it's yeah. always like R. It's <laughs> coming it back and then quickly R.I.P. No, I just mean like, is it that sad that it's gone? Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's hard touché. to say. Touche. Touche. Um, I just touched myself. Yeah. How often does that happen on the radio? First in 10 years. Right. Well, anyway, um, yeah, they were doing these Tuesday night things and we would all hang out. And that's actually how Tiffany from Minute Magic <laughs> met Julio. And now they're a couple and they live in L.A. and it's pretty cool. Yes. But um, yeah, Mikkel was wearing gym shorts and uh, tuxedo tails when I met him and sneakers. And I was like, what is going on here? And and him and David had this amazing thing together and Matt and Julio. I found out that dude had a band. Went to go see them play. Thought they were cool. Got to know Rasmus a bit, uh, who's playing keys later. And he and Mikkel played me Creation Keeps the Devil Away before it was mastered. And I was like, this is cool. But I was like, I wish I'd worked on this. And then like a like a like a like a wish coming true, uh, Mikkel approached me about doing the second to last record, which is called "My Head Is a Ballroom Who Needs a Palace Anyway," and that got us all playing together. And uh, yeah, then we made another record, the new one, "80 Years." And uh, yeah, I want to hear a song, but can you explain to the audience how it's going to work today, since it's different than we've ever done before? Oh, yeah. Well, you mean in the sense that Mikkel's not here? Yes, that the band oh. leader is not here. Have you ever seen a boat at sea and you're not quite sure if there's anyone aboard? Yes. We are that boat. Great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. A Boat Adrift. Yes. By Hesses Moore. What's the name of the first <laughs> song I'm going to put? <laughs> what, uh, what is the name of this Bear song? Bear Song. Gentlemen. Bear Song. 
Bear Song. Bear Song. Off of the second to last record, which is My Head is a Ballroom. Who needs a palace anyway? Here we go, live on Snacky Tunes.
The new record, 80 Years, came out this past December. Yeah. Earlier records uh, had a bit more kind of pop constrained three to four minute tracks. This is, this is some would say, sprawling. Um, how did the songwriting process evolve um, from the first maybe four records, five records, to the sixth and seventh record? Is Mikkel still on? I'm right here. I just want to say that was that was really trippy to hear you guys play. It was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, how, 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 is it, how is it to see your boat adrift at sea without you being on it? Yeah. I mean, they got this. They caught the wind in that sail on on, the, on that whole thing. That's for sure. Oh, you saw a that sailboat. I definitely saw like a like a motorboat, like just dead in the water. That's so interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Just go. What, what boats yeah. did you guys see? No. Uh, <laughs> anyway, just go, just kidding. Can I can yeah. I just real quick introduce since people have heard oh, yes, what's please, going on? Please. So uh, David Mason is playing the drum pad. So that's actually not a, a drum sequencer playing that. That's a real human being. You can believe it. Well, yes, technically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Then Rasmus Bilabanka, who's uh, who's actually families here. We're lo- literally looking at them outside the window, which is pretty cool. He's playing the SH 101, the Roland SH 101 uh, monophonic keyboard. Very awesome. Uh, you already met me. I'm Andrew I'm playing some bass guitar. And then the amazing, wonderful Matt Parker. Hello. From the great city of Miami, Florida. Yes, sir. Ripping it on the on the s- s- smaxophone. Smaxophone. Yeah. We, we miss you, Mickle. <laughs> we do miss you, Mickle. Yeah, we miss you, man. Oh my God, the sound is so good, man. Question back yeah. to you: Evolution of songwriting from your first five, and essentially, like, also being at this for eighteen years. How has the songwriting evolved? Why has it evolved? And have your collaborators influenced that process as well? Uh, very much so. I think, particularly the the record before the new one. Um, which was called My Head is a Ballroom, Who Needs a Palace Anyway? That was the, a record that really opened in up uh, the process and and really with keeping the whole group in mind in the, in the writing process and kind of bringing more like pieces to the group and then we workshopped it into finished arra- arrangements. And then... Uh, I think for the for the latest record here, it was still uh, sort of pieces written by me, but then really trying to make everybody uh, do exactly what they do best. So, for instance, really leaving it to Mason how to like program a lot of the synthesizers and, um, and drum machines, and and for for Andrew to like engineer and. For Rasmus uh, also to help come in and shape more like the overall structure, and and for Matt to be Matt Packer for for a good fifteen minutes on <laughs> on one track, there's just an epic solo where he sort of chases with himself, and then and then more to that process to have sort of Andrew sit with me and drive through the arrangements over and over and over. So really. Uh, not working necessarily as a group the whole time, but really try and, and make everybody make best use of, of all this amazing talent. Because when I'm home, I, I put on a listening center record, which is David Mason's record, and I, I love that sound, or I listen to Midnight Magic, or or I listen to something Rasmus is doing, or, or we play music together all the time. So it's like I want those influences on the record as much as possible. Were you ever I think si- that you- sort of informed the process? Will you ever cite specific tracks from your collaborators' other works? Be like, oh, I want you to do that thing that you did on that, on that B-side, or I want to get that bass line from, from that record. Is there any way that you call specifically to kind of weave that together as influence for the writing of your own music? Uh, maybe not that specifically. Uh, I'll more, also, like, I think I'll be, make more vague references. Like, can we have some, like, listening sensor stuff here? And then sort of blank um but uh but but at the same time i'm also like ridiculously anal about certain details so that's um mason knows how to also make that happen in the drum parts or and and so on so i feel like you're good to leave you're very good at at as a as a band leader to uh like leave a certain amount of room for extreme responsibility for each player to to, to, for their for their own input yeah (laughs) like you raise the bar yeah Do you ever sometimes wish your human collaborators were computers? (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes in rehearsal. (laughs) Right, right, yeah. No, I kind of imagine that, uh, 
that I wasn't there today for the preparation for this, but I imagine that it, it went smoothly because it's it's easy to have a band where where everybody's a producer, I suppose. Um, everybody sort of knows what to do. Can we Only when when I step in, there's this obviously this thing always happens like oh now he's there like let's talk bullshit and and uh, drink beer you know <laughs> but I, I imagine as soon as i'm away it'll be just smooth and genius a lot of crying there was a lot of <laughs> i did i did want to just point out one thing about the last record uh you know M- mickle does not give himself enough credit because he played you know almost all i played bass on like one half of one song but he plays bass on everything he plays guitar and everything he plays a lot of synth and keyboard overdubs and obviously does all the singing and stuff so it's pretty amazing to work with someone who can do all that in one go and yet allow other people to be like you know what i want you to play that it sounds better when you do that let's do it like that that's that's really great can we hear another song absolutely what are you going to play for us uh this is uh a a, a very condensed version <laughs> of a song called it's backwards no matter what i do which is on the new record 80 years Thank you. 
Mikhail, you lay out the argument for the evolution to a veteran band and how certain records couldn't be made until someone has made something um, after their third or fourth or fifth or sixth record. What are your thoughts on the stays, where those bands exist in culture and how they can be folded into the current musical landscape? Ooh, I think you were quoting some Jay Rottenberg here from the liner notes, possibly. Possibly. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, f for me, it's just a, it's a journey. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised it's it's been maintained so long, this one thread called Hess is More, which is now, I guess, 18 years since uh, the starting point. Uh, when I graduated conservatory and um, I mean we it's always just a process of making music and then it's like when you release a record or play a concert I guess it's like it's like when you cut through a tree and you can sort of count the the rings and see what's going on but but it, it's all almost it's just an immediate picture of where you are I think we had some not so flattering image that we're creating this this long sausage of music and sometimes you cut through and, and take a bite of it um and and as far as where that fits in culture um i mean obviously there will always be a, an interest in in something that's new and, and that's the same for me it's like oh you know this is something i never heard of maybe i'll be more immediately curious and then i think uh you can sort of hit that middle mark where it's like, yeah, it's not new, but it's also not old. I guess DFA really hit that nail on the head with their with their slogan, which is, what is how does it go? Andrew, you'll know that. Uh, too, too new to be, what is it? Too new to be classic, too old to be, too old to be new? What is that? Something like that? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the sentiment. Yeah. <laughs> well, we want to make sure that we have time for one more Put song. It. Thank you for joining us today. Um, where can people find you, listen to the records, follow you, get tickets for the upcoming uh, event? Yeah, um, the, the tickets must be on the on the DJ Cookbook, right? Uh, for for the Saturday, uh, Monday thing. And as, as far as our our stuff, it's uh, it's Hess is more, so it's H E S S is more it's a play on less is more so we're we're quite easy to find on the, on the internets and um yeah there will be info about shows and records and pictures of all those fantastic musicians we just heard play i'm, I'm blown away we want to thank uh nira for coming by make sure to pre-order the book ohas uh it is stunning we cannot recommend it enough uh, please make sure to go to bit.do backslash Snacky Tunes Live to get tickets for a live event at El Rey Theater with Golden Voice, Wexler's Deli, and Naya performing live. And uh, what is the name of the song? Now, this is going to be the first time ever. We're going to have a musical performance over Skype, piped into the studio, and then through your podcast listening ears. Mikhail, what are you going to play for us to take us out? I am uh, going to... Uh play a, a tune that's also the final tune of the new record and this tune is called you may and uh, i'm so fortunate to have a previously mentioned very first collaborator and uh, um my brother who's a fantastic piano player so i'll get things started and then uh, nikolai will join in and we'll attempt some four-handed piano but here it is perfect. you may perfect thank you for listening uh we'll be back next week with another episode of snacky tunes and a big shout out to Vitor today because this one, this oh, yeah. one was a doozy. To the, to the engineer Vitor, you are the man. You are the man, Vitor. Oh man! Uh, thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. You may come to. I may come to you one day and tell you how I feel.
come to me one day and tell me how you feel. I may come to you one day and tell you how I feel. Yes, Nikolai. Yes, Mikkel. Wow. Beautiful. Yay. And our mom is here listening. So Hello, mom. Business. Mama has in the house. Right on. We talk about food. We talk about music. With musical dudes. Finger on the pulse. Snacky tunes. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food Radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Ever wonder what kind of podcast Julia Child would have made? Probably would have been one where she introduced you to all of her latest discoveries and favorite people. And that's exactly the tradition we're following on Inside Julia's Kitchen, podcast of the Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts. Join me, Todd Shulkin, your host, and the Foundation's Executive Director, as I bring you inside the Foundation's world to meet the bright lights of today's food universe, just as Julia used to do from her own famous kitchen. New episodes air on Heritage Radio Network, Wednesdays at noon Eastern. Listen in.